Hello, good morning, my friends. Happy Halloween for some of you. And we're back on our reading of the Spirits book. We are at chapter two, part one, chapter two. And the name of this chapter is The General Elements of the Universe. And the topics are the knowledge of the origin of things, spirit and matter, the properties of matter, and universal space. So the beginning is the knowledge of the origin of things. And it starts every time with questions for the spirits and they answer the questions, okay? So the question, we are at question number 17. Can humans know the origin of things? And then the answer is no. On earth, God does not allow everything to be revealed to them. Number 18. Will they ever be able to grasp the mystery of things how now hidden from them? And the spirits answer, The veil is lifted as they become more and more purified. But in order to understand certain things, they need faculties they do not yet have. And then there is question 19. Can humans grasp some of nature's secret through scientific investigation? And then the spirit answers. Science has been given to them for their advancement, advancement in all matters, but they cannot go beyond the limits set by God. And then there is a note from the author. The more humans are allowed to grasp such mysteries, the more they should admire the power and wisdom of the Creator. However, whether, whether through pride or through weakness, their own minds often render them victims of illusion, and, and they pile theory upon theory. Every day they see how many errors they have mistaken for truths, and, not, and how many truths They have dismissed as errors. These realizations are further blows to their pride. Number 20, question number 20. Outside the realm of scientific investigation, can humans receive communications of a higher order regarding matters that go beyond the scope of their senses? And the answer of the spirit was yes. If God deems it useful. God will reveal that science, what science cannot detect. And the author writes a note under it. It is through such communications that humans can, to a certain degree, know about their past and their future destiny. Now, the other topic for the, the following questions is spirit and matter. Question number 21. Is matter eternal like God, or was it created at some specific time in the past? And the spirit answers, only God knows. Nevertheless, there is something you should realize by, by using your reason. God, the very personification of love and charity, has never been inactive. No matter how long ago you might imagine the onset of the divine action to have been, could you possibly conceive of God as ever having been idle for even one second? Question number 22. Matter is generally defined as that which has extension, that which can impress our senses, that which is impenetrable. Are these definitions correct? And then the spirit answers. From your point of view, they are correct because you can only talk about matters that are familiar to you. Matter, however, also exists in states that are unfamiliar. For example, it may be so ethereal and subtle that your senses cannot detect it. It is matter nonetheless, even though you do not perceive it as such. And then the question continues. Then how may we define matter? And then the spirit continues answering. Matter is the tie that enchains spirit. It is the instrument that spirit uses and upon which is simultaneously 
exerts its action. And then the author makes a small note under. From this viewpoint, one could say that matter is the agent or intermediary that enables spirit to act while the same time being acted upon by spirit. And then question number 23rd. What is spirit? And then the spirit's answer. The intelligent principle of the universe. And then it, the question follows. What is spirit's innermost nature? And then the spirit's answer. It is not easy to explain spirit in your language. For you, it is nothing because it is not something palpable. Nevertheless, for us, it is something. You must realize that nothing means nothing and nothing does not exist. So, then there's question 24. Is spirit synonymous with intelligence? And then the spirit answers. Intelligence is one of the essential attributes of spirit, but both merge into a common principle. Thus, for you, they are one and the same thing. Number 25. Question. Is spirit independent of matter or is it only a property of matter as colors are property of light and as sound is a property of air? Then the spirit answers. They are distinct from each other, but the union of spirit and matter is necessary to enable matter to act intelligently. And then the question follows. Is this union equally necessary for the manifestation of spirit? And then the spirit answers. For you is necessary, because you are not built to perceive spirit apart from matter. Your senses are not formed to do so. And then in... Parenthesis. In this section, we understand spirit to mean the intelligent principle rather than the entities that designated by the name. And then comes question 26. Can we conceive of spirit apart from matter and matter apart from spirit? And then the spirit answers, absolutely, through and though. 27. So, are there two general elements in the universe, matter and spirit? And then the spirit answers, yes, and over everything is God, the creator and author of all. These three elements comprise the principle of, of all that exists. They are the universal trinity. However, to the element of matter must be added the universal fluid and then the author makes a note on fluid, which means the universal cosmic fluid is the primitive elementary matter whose modifications and transformations comprise the innumerable variety of bodies found in nature. As the universal elementary principle, it offers two distinct states, etherization or imponderability, which may be considered the normal primitive state, and materialization or ponderability, which is, in a certain way, only consecutive to the former. The intermediary point is the transformation of the fluid into tangible matter. However, even then there is not a brusque transition, because our imponderable fluids may be regarded as a halfway phase between the two states. That was a note made by Allan Kardec in Genesis International Spirits Council 2009 edition, part, uh, page 354. Now, continuing. So, the, the, back to the question. The question was, so, are there two general elements in the universe, matter and spirit? And then he added to, added God to it as a trinity and the universal fluid, which plays an intermediary role between spirit and matter per se, since matter is too dense for spirit to act upon, upon it directly. Although from a certain point of view this fluid may be regarded as part of the material element, 
It differs from it due to spe special properties. If it were simply matter, there would be no reason for spirit not to be matter too. It is placed between spirit and matter, yet is a fluid. it is a fluid, just as matter is matter. It is in its countless combinations with matter and under the direction of spirit. It is capable of producing an infinite variety of things about which you still know very, very little. By being the agent upon which spirit acts, this universal primitive or elementary fluid is the principle without which matter would forever remain in a state of dispersion. It would never acquire the properties given to it by, by gravitation. And then the question follows, might this fluid be what we call electricity? And then the spirits answer, we have started uh, we have stated that it is capable of countless combinations. What you call the ele electric and magnetic fluids are both modifications of the one universal fluid. Properly speaking, this fluid is a perfect and subtler matter that may be considered as being independent from matter per se. Now, question 28. Since spirit is something in and of itself, wouldn't it be clearer and less subject to confusion to label these two general elements as inert matter and intelligent matter? And then the spirit answers. Words do not matter much to us. It is up to you to formulate your language in a way that you can understand one another. The disputes among you almost always arise because you cannot agree on the meanings of the words you use. Your language is incomplete regarding things that do not touch your senses. And then the author writes down a note. One obvious fact dominates all theories. We see matter which is not intelligent, and we see an intelligent principle that is independent of matter. Nonetheless, the origin of a connection between these two are unknown to us. Whether they have a common origin and necessary points of contact between them, and whether intelligence has its own independent existence or is only a property of effect or effect, as some claim, or even whether it is an emanation of the divinity. This is all unknown to us. Matter and intelligence are dis disti distinct as far as we are concerned. Thus, we regard them as being two principles comprising the universe. Above the these, however, we see an intelligence dominating and governing all others. It and it differs from them due to its essential attributes. It is uh, this supreme intelligence that we say that we call God. Now, there is another topic: the properties of matter. And the questions are the following. That's the number twenty-nine question. Is ponderability an essential attribute of matter? And then the spirit answers. Of matter, as you understand it, yes, but not of matter considered as the universal fluid. The ethereal and subtle matter that forms this fluid is imponderable to you, and yet it is the very principle of your ponderable matter. And by ponderable, he explains, uh, it, it means worth serious considerations or having appreciable, appreciable weight. Um, in other words, something material that can be studied. So, uh, the author writes down, ponderability is a relative property. Outside the gravitational pole of the globes, there is no weight, but as there is no up or down, just as there is no up or down. Now, number 30. Does matter consist of one or many elements? And then the, the um, spirit answers, one single 
primitive element. The bodies you regard as simple are not true elements, but rather transformations of the primitive of one of the one primitive matter. Question number 31st. Where do the different properties of matter come from? And then the spirit answers, from the modifications that the elementary molecules undergo as a result of their combining under certain conditions. Question 32. Then wouldn't flavors, odors, colors, sounds, even the poisonous or healing qualities of certain bodies be no more than modifications of the one and the same primitive substance? And the, the spirit answers, yes, of course. They would only exist due to the disposition of the organs that are meant to perceive them. And then the author writes down a note. This principle is proven by the fact that not all people perceive the qualities of objects in the same way. What one person finds tasty, another might find disgusting. What appears blue to one person might appear red to another. Something that is poisonous for some might be harmless or even healthy for others. Question 33. Um, is the same elementary matter capable of undergoing all possible modifications and acquiring all possible properties? And the spirit answers, yes. And this is what you should understand when we say that everything is in everything. So that with that, he makes a note saying that this principle explains the phenomenon known by all magnetizers, which consists in using willpower to confer very different properties upon and given any given substance. Water, uh, he continues, for instance, is a specific flavor, for, for instance, a specific flavor or even the active qualities of other substances. Since there is uh, but one primitive element, and since the properties of different bodies are but modifications of this one element, it follows that the most innocuous substance has the same underlying principle as the most harmful substance. Thus, water is made up of one part of oxygen and two parts of hydrogen, but becomes corrosive if the proportion of oxygen is doubled. Uh, an, an analogous transformation may be produced through magnetic action directed by the human will. That's a note by the author. Now, continuing from the answer, oh, from the note of the author under the answer of the spirit. Oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, and all the other elements we consider to be simple are only modifications of the one primitive substance. As it is yet impossible for us to go back to this substance except by thinking about it. The elements truly are elements to us, and without further ado, we can consider them as such until further notice. And then he makes another question under the same subject. Doesn't this, F, this theory affirm the opinion of those who do not believe in more than only two essential properties of matter, force and movement, and who believe that all the other properties are for only secondary effects that vary according to the intensity of the force and, the, and direction of the movement? And the spirit answers. This opinion is correct, but it should also add, according to the arrangement of the molecules, this may be seen, for example, in an opaque body that becomes transparent and vice versa. Number 34. Do molecules have a definite form? And then the spirit answers, certainly. Molecules have a form, but you are incapable of discerning it. And then under this question comes another one. Is this form constant or variable? And then the spirit answers, it's constant for the primitive elementary molecules, but variable for the secondary ones, which are only aggregations of the former. I, uh, sorry, however, what you term, what you term a molecule is still very far from being the elementary molecule. And then there is another topic. They talk about universal space. Number 35. 
Is universal space infinite or limited? The spirit answers, infinite. It, if it had limits, what would be beyond them? I know this baffles your reason, yet reason itself tells you that it can be no other way. The same is true of the idea of the infinite. You'll never be able to comprehend it from your tiny sphere of thinking. And then the author uh, writes down, suppose we were to imagine a limit to space, no matter how far out our thought may place it. Reason tells us that there must still be something beyond it, and so on and so forth to infinity. Even if there were only an absolute void beyond that limit, there would still be space. Question number 36. Is there an absolute void in any part of universal space? And then the spirit answers. No, there's no void. What appears to you to be a void is actually occupied by matter and cannot be detected by your senses or instruments. <laughs> and that was the end of the this part. <laughs> we go to chapter 3 next time. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Big kiss and see you next time. Bye-bye.